Hoboken Talks. You're live. Oh, Ryan, you want to just turn it off? Hey, guys, it's uh, Hoboken Talks, and we're so glad you're joining us. Uh, we are broadcasting live right now, and we're streaming out live on either Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. But, of course, the show is also archived, and you can listen to it later. But we want you here now. Uh, in fact, we are broadcasting on, how do we put this? It's uh, Thursday night as our usual broadcast time, and we are broadcasting live the eve of Christmas Eve, right? I think that's how we would describe it. And uh, we're, we're celebrating Hobokenites. That's what we talk about. And they don't have to live here, but they have to be here in spirit and have been affected by growing up in Hoboken. Uh, past guests have included Steve Zane, Victoria Magliano, Dave Carey, Anthony Dell'Aquila, Jim Link, Erwin Chussed, and Liz, Lindsay Swindle. In fact, we're over 40 broadcasts to date, and we are finding this is one of the best ways to deal with uh, shall we say, COVID and being kind of a bit sequestered. And we're still getting the word out to you guys. Um, and feel free to uh, chat. Uh, you can do that, uh, again, through the YouTube is probably the easiest, but we hear a lot of people are doing it through Twitter and Facebook, and we'd love to get your questions. And tonight we have a really special guest. His name is Eric Hammer. And uh, he is sitting to my left, and he's going to come on the screen momentarily. And I could say that Eric is one of the big fans of this show. He's a big fan of Hoboken. And believe it or not, he doesn't even live in Hoboken. <laughs> but somehow his growing up years really uh, got imprinted in his memory, and he I'm going to guess, thinks about Hoboken every day. Is that I, true, Eric? That is very true. I, there's, it sounds crazy, but there's not a moment that I don't go through the day with some memories or stories about Hoboken. Right. And I don't, we've had a few great conversations, and I never really asked you that question, but I knew the answer. And you were such a cheerleader for Hoboken, and you probably drive the people in Edison a little crazy. Because, <laughs> like, you're in Edison, and you're probably talking about Hoboken. And actually, from from what you saw with the memorabilia, I think our house, because of what my mother had saved over the years, is like the Hoboken Museum in Edison, because we have so many mementos and things from you know from growing up. And uh, since my mother collected so many things, um, you know, it, it's like a memory in time. Sure. And so, uh, tell us what decade you're growing up in Hoboken, so people get some context here. Okay, so this is mainly the uh, 60s, 70s, and 80s um, in Hoboken. So uh, my, uh, I guess my grandparents and family at that time came from the Lower East Side as well as Brooklyn, and they moved to Hoboken. Uh, we're not sure why they moved to Hoboken. I suspect it's because of a German connection, because my, uh, my grandparents came from, uh, from Germany. And I think there were a lot of Germans at that time living in, in Hoboken. So I, I think that was one of the reasons why they had lived here. Uh, they had moved a lot within, um, I guess, the Lower East Side and, uh, and Brooklyn. And if you look at some of the old pictures of the tenements there, this is a, this is a, a, a big improvement uh, in many of the places in, uh, in, in Hoboken. So um, we're not quite sure why they moved to Hoboken, but I'm glad they did. Right, right. So, yeah, Rand just kind of posted some text that, um, you know, if you're seeing like a, uh, a little stripe down the middle of your screen, we did broadcast like this, uh, shall we say, three, four months ago. And because of the recent uh, surge again, here we are in, in December, uh, close to uh, Christmas, uh, December 23rd, I believe is the date. And uh, we are concerned about COVID again. So we do have a plexi barrier between us so that we can speak mass, uh, massless and have a good conversation. And we have a shout out from Melody Joyce. Who's that? 
Melody is a, a, a friend of mine from the uh, the time we grew up, and she's also a big Hoboken fan as well. Excellent. So, uh, Excellent. Melody, Maybe thank a you future for, interview with Melody. Possibly. So try to smooth the, 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 that suggestion to Melody. And so we always make a comment, uh, you know, who are you looking at in the backgrounds behind you? Who's that? Okay, so uh, both these pictures happen to be my father. Um, the one on, um, I guess, by left, where Bob is, uh, is a younger picture of my father, probably about 1938 in Hoboken. Uh, we're trying to identify the location in Hoboken. We, we think it may be around Willow and 7th or maybe the 13th Street area, but it's on, on, it just says a picture in Hoboken, even from the back of the card. And the one on uh, the right, where uh, behind me, is on 12th and Park, and this is where my uh, my grandparents moved uh, to Hoboken. So, if you look further in the back, there's a water tower that's U.S. testing. Uh, the cars seem to be from the 40s and 50s. Uh, if you look at the background, and uh, you know, just a great uh, a great picture. So this is where a lot of things. So we um, have a shout out from uh, Phyllis Jonas. Yes, this is from my um, my wife's side. So Phyllis, thank you for checking in. I think you're going to see the upbringing of Hoboken. It's going to be a, a lot of lot of fun. Perfect. And Sam? Ah, uh, my old hockey buddy. Hi, Sam. Thank wow. you for actually you hold up your hockey mask. <laughs> That's a good connection with Sam. Maybe Sam, you're gonna you're gonna like this. I hope it comes out in the picture. But this is a picture of uh, an early mask um, when I was playing street hockey, and um, I don't know if uh, Sam uh, remembers this picture. I think at that point I may have had the old, what are they, skeleton mask or, or something else when we were playing street hockey. Right. Uh, well, th this mask has uh, taken some hits. We're actually looking at the mask, <laughs> and it looks like uh, Freddy Krueger's <laughs> alter ego. It's pretty intense. And, it, and, and it's so the New York Islanders, uh, I think. What's that? The, the background, I think, is the New York Islanders. The background. Oh, the paint job? Uh, the paint kind of? job. On the yeah, picture. sure. That's uh, Long Island Colors. Uh, Correct. Nassau yeah. County. Yeah, where the Islanders, I don't know if they still play there. But that, so uh, it, yeah. it, somebody gave it to me. I think his name was uh, Joe. And at that time, I guess I had the old, those crazy uh, little plastic ones that you might see also in the horror movies, the old hockey. Right. Movie. But did, is that the mask you wore? I, I wore that for many years. Wow, yes. It's kind of intimidating. Uh, Not for ice hockey right. because that thing would have been. We got Jack Frey on the line. Ah, here. that's my uh, my nephew Jack. Okay, so it's uh, the camera family show here tonight. I love it. I love it. Um, and uh, where would since you brought up the hockey mask uh, through uh, Mr. Perez there, um, where did you play hockey in Hoboken at that time? Well, uh, we played in various locations. Uh, if it was just a one on one, because I did play goalie. Uh, I don't know if uh, um, John is also watching. He played um, with Sammy, and I played on the corner of 13th and uh, Bloomfield, which is quite hilarious because uh, if they missed me or the net, it would hit a building. Right. And we didn't break any windows, but uh, it came it came pretty pretty close. Uh, otherwise, we would play in uh, tennis courts uh, in Columbus Park. And there was also a time when we also played on top of the uh, uh, Lincoln Tunnel. There's tennis courts as well as a ball field. And uh, we also played at that time. Uh, we also played with another uh, man. His name was Vincent. Uh, I've lost touch with him, but we're trying to reconnect with him. He, he lives on the 7th and uh, Bloomfield Street. So maybe he'll check in tonight. Possible. And so there was really no dedicated hockey field when you were growing up? No, nothing, okay. nothing. Uh, this uh, is Michael Gelman. That's my brother-in-law. Excellent. From Maryland, uh, tuning in. Okay. Okay. Um, and whoops, where are we going here? Okay. Oh, sorry. that's my phone. We, we have Eric's phone. The alarm. Well, the reason uh, for the alarm is because you put the alarm on? it's reminding me to tune into Hoboken Talks. Oh, which is a regularly scheduled <laughs> alarm, but here you are on Hoboken Talks, so. A little uh, conflict there. Um, so, okay. And I will say that Eric has probably tuned in to every Hoboken Talks. And if he missed one, he probably followed up on YouTube, which you can do also. Absolutely. And uh, we really 
I mean, that's how we connected with you is through Hoboken Talks, right? Absolutely, because some of the comments and things like people right. are sharing tonight. And you've since become a member and you're a gift shop purchaser. So you are the perfect audience. And if, the... if you like Hoboken, the Hoboken Museum is the place to go. It's, it's everything that we grew up with. Uh, you showed me some videos of Hoboken as well sure. to bring back. And it's really... Uh, just just a wonderful place. Right, right. We we think you live in Hoboken. <laughs> okay, cool. Okay, let's go for some more pictures. We got a lot of ground to cover. Go ahead. Uh, we're moving forward. So we're starting off with a newspaper article. They're not going to be able to read it probably. So you're going to have to summarize this. Okay, so this is back, I think, in 1940. So there, there was a robbery. Um, in my grandparents' candy store. So it's very uh, small print, but uh, I'll read it. So uh, Tobin was charged with stealing the auto of auto Edward Willis of 309 10th Street, Hoboken, last Friday night. Then according to police, he went to the candy store of Max Kammer at 314 9th Street, where he forced entrance through the door from the cellar and took cigarettes valued at $35. Whoa. <laughs> plus $12 in cash. And then the handle was knocked off a, a safe containing $300 in cash in a futile attempt to open it. So this was uh, back in 1940. So uh, there was a robbery, uh, I guess, of a adjoining structure. So this is on 9th and Clinton. There's a church across the street. It's now become applied housing. And they also, I'm not sure if it's the same uh, bad person who broke in, but they also talk about another burglary at the Traffic Tavern, which is now a veterinarian uh, office across oh, from Trader Joe's and, of course, very close to the Madison. Hmm. And uh, uh, I know a lot of people will remember the Traffic Lounge. Uh, Melody. Okay, uh, that's for the clarinet in high school then. That's and you'll, cool. And we don't want to give away more of the that's fine. It's coming fine. up, but it's fine. Uh, and and it, it's you know uh, they never mentioned the candy store um, in the uh, in the in I guess in the um, when we were bringing up um, you know we passed Ninth and Clinton so many times there was never mentioned that there was even a candy store there so. I don't know if it was because of some issues with the store or or my grandfather did pass away at a very young age, but there was no mention of the candy right. store. Many times candy stores were kind of like a place where they might place bets and do that type of enterprise. Any knowledge of that or? They did mention that the, you know, because they had a jukebox. So there was some mob, uh, I guess, issues that did take place at that time. And that may be one of the reasons why uh, nobody wanted to go near the, the candy store. Okay. Uh, so it had nothing to do with the, with the robbery. Uh, right, right. Um, okay, we're moving on with vigils to help tell this story. Um, this is our backdrop photo also. So again, um, this is back to 12th and, and Park. So my, uh, my grandparents uh, were in the first of the high structure on the right-hand side there. And uh, for many years, they had lived there, I guess, from 1936 until um, maybe to the early 60s. Right. And looks like there's not a spot on the block with cars, which we always talk about as being an issue. We have Sal Lizboza. And here's another one of our my classmates who I grew up with. Uh, I reconnected with a lot of these people thanks to Facebook. Facebook has a lot of dark side to it, but I think I found some good side with Hoboken Museum as well as many, many of my friends. Cool. And I'm going to guess that block looks pretty similar. It, 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 you know, except it is for very, very, United very, testing. which is very interesting with Hoboken, except for certain blocks. A lot of them have remained the same as yeah. they were. Sure. Sure. And you're right. United States testing is in the background with the water tower. Right. Uh, it's a little blurry, but probably uh, then hostess would be on the corner there on 14th and, uh, and Willow. Uh, of course that has all changed to, uh, probably condos at the present time. Right, right. And the Malibu Diner, I think, is right there. Yeah, right and next I guess a lot of people know the Malibu is kind of an institution in Hoboken. It actually, there was a diner there before it, but I don't think people remember it. 
and the Malibu, Malibu is officially closing 1231. So if you need your skillet omelet uh, or your uh, big burger and fries, you should head over before New Year's. And, it, and it's interesting, the diner reminds me of my father. After the candy store, I guess they closed in Hoboken, he opened with his uncle in, uh, in Manhattan a, uh, a luncheonette. And uh, it, the thing with the food with my father was very challenging because he was very particular with food. So we couldn't really eat out anywhere because he always felt that there was some issue with the food. Oh, OK. OK. <laughs> so um, it's yeah. They also talk about in Hoboken, you didn't really have that many restaurants that you went out. People didn't go out to eat, but they did go to luncheonettes, you know, more for uh, working class town and uh, you know, having lunch uh, if you worked at Bethlehem Steel or one of the places. But when you went home, it was kind of expected you'd have dinner at home. Absolutely. And I think that's a change in the time for today, for sure. Yeah. And delivering food, not a, not, didn't happen. And there's my niece, uh, Catherine. Oh, cool. Great photos. Thanks, Catherine, for checking in. And uh -huh. uh, Catherine and uh, Jack, my uh, niece and nephew, had spent a long time in Hoboken because my parents lived there for many years, so right. they know Hoboken very well. Okay, okay. Uh, I think we've had the most amount of family members from uh, the camera connection here uh, than most of our shows. Pretty cool. So who's this uh, trifecta crew? Okay, so this is a picture of my mother, and uh, let's see, the order would be, um, I would be on the left, my sister, who the youngest, is in the middle, and my brother is on the right. So this is, uh, I'm the middle child, and uh, this is uh, when they had moved back to 13th and Bloomfield because originally when my parents got married, they lived on 5th and Garden. Gotcha. And circa? This is early 60s. Okay. Yep. Yep. And we're moving on. Ah. Now this, I, I, of course, I'm going to give the location very shortly, but if you are familiar with Hoboken from that time frame, this is on the corner of 14th and Garden Street. And you can date the picture because if you look in the background, Troy Towers does not exist yet. Right. So it's probably about 63 or 64 because I think Troy Tower went up in 65 or 66. And the, of course, the Hoboken Shore Railroad uh, freight line is in the background. There. Right, which is a little hard to see, but you're so familiar with it, it kind of pops out. Can you talk a little bit about the Hoboken Shore Railroad? Obviously, it doesn't exist, but uh, when you were growing up in Hoboken, it became an important thing. Absolutely. For me, uh, and we'll show some pictures uh, in a little while as well, but I, I grew up on the Hoboken Shore Railroad because I lived on 13th and Bloomfield, and the, uh, the train headquarters was on 14th and uh, Bloomfield. So whenever I saw the train go out, I used to go to the train yard, and whenever they saw me, they allowed me to go up in the engine. And I used to ride around uh, the whole town on this engine. So I got to see a different perspective of Hoboken than maybe many people did. Because um, we went into, um, I guess, US testing. Right. And uh, also um, Hostess. Uh, there was a, a soap factory on 14th. And just give Park a little Avenue. shout out to Jack and, Silver. And Jack, Jack, and you have been so great for me on all these shows. I really appreciate your uh, your checking in tonight. Uh, and I, I've caught a lot of jo uh, shows that Jack has done on the Jack uh, is the our Hoboken guy. Talk. We really appreciate it. And Jack was on one of the shows as well, I think, yeah. right? Yes, we started with that. So, uh, you know, from, from the Lipton Tea building as well, I think it was not Lipton Tea at that time. It may have been just a, uh, a warehouse. Uh, at that point, but then on to Bethlehem Steel, right, where we're here today. So there, right. the train line and, and most of the Hoboken uh, people that have checked in know this. Right down Hudson Street was the rail line. Um, one of the side tracks went into Bethlehem Steel, and then the center uh, went into um, to Maxwell House and further on down River Road at that time. I guess now we call it Sinatra Drive. Yes. Right? And to the piers on 3rd. And um, I guess at that time it was right by Marine View Towers. Uh, but I I spent a lot of time on that. And there's some funny stories with double parked cars. 
uh, of course, oh. car problems were there. To, what what they used to do, they had master keys, and they used to push the cars out of the way that were parked in front of Bethlehem Steel, and that's how the train was able to get down the track. Uh, they pushed them back afterwards, and the remaining cars that the master keys didn't fit, they, they actually had to tow. Wow. So you're saying they had master keys to move the cars? I guess at that time, I mean, I'm not, I'm not a mechanic. Maybe we had some mechanics on the line, but the keys seemed to fit some of the cars. Right, right. And they were able to unlock the ignition and, right. and move it. And just so people understand, this was not a commuter train. Uh, you had the buses down Washington Street for that purpose, just like you do now. But this was to move commercial goods uh, along the waterfront primarily right. and for the companies you mentioned. Uh, and we have Ellen Cammer Frey. So that's my uh, sister. She's commenting on this picture as well as the one before. Right. Uh, she's the one looking down uh, <laughs> at the end. And uh, right. now, and I would have met her maybe. Yes, back she, came she came to the, the Hope Open yep. Museum. Sure. Absolutely. Sure. We're not sure if that's my father or my uncle in the picture. My cousins believe it's my father. I believe it's my uncle Murray. Uh, we're not sure. I'm trying to get a picture from my cousins, but so far they have not given me a picture right. that, to right. compare. So behind him uh, is the steakhouse. Yeah, I think it's right? the brass rail, maybe. No, no, no. no. It's um, it's had various names. I'm sorry, I'm forgetting its current Dino names. It's Dino and Harry. Dino and Harry. Okay. And uh, scenes from the film on the waterfront were shot there. There's a wedding scene. Oh, really? Uh, and where Marlon and Edie are sort of sharing a beer together, and then they get oh, sort wow. of thrown into a wedding situation, and so that happens in that location. And recently, they shot a film on. Uh, you know, a, sort of a big production film. And I didn't, I can't remember that production, but they actually took out the main window. Because they Trial think, of the Chicago 7. Trial of the Chicago 7. Uh, yes, was shot there. And uh, they, they, they had fun shooting there and replacing the window. And behind is the building, which is, to, you know, that white tall building, which is... Uh, still has that steel awning coming off of it. And I think it was the company, I don't know if it was built for that, for, but for many years, it was the desiccated coconut company. <laughs> and we do have different uh, metal containers from them for shipping. Uh, and then, oh, Ellen Bob. Patrick, I love your museum. Thank you, Ellen. This is a real love fest for the museum <laughs> from the camera family. But we will accept these. And we're looking north. We're, we're, looking, looking we're looking north, north. shall we say. By the way, the Hope of Control World at minute 55 and on the waterfront, you could see a live picture of it actually in operation. A minute and 55 seconds. You probably have like a freeze frame on your phone <laughs> of the shot uh, and an alarm to let us know when to look at it. <laughs> anyway, so, okay. Um, Cub Scouts, probably important growing up here in Hoboken. This, you can't get more Hoboken than this. Uh, obviously Hoboken, New Jersey, and PAC-14. Uh, so this was on, they had um, the meetings on 9th and Washington. There's At that time, it was the Presbyterian Church, and we met in the basement, and they had a, a bowling alley where you at, manually would change the pins. Uh, so I only joined the Cub Scouts, but uh, again, thanks to my mother, I never would have kept this, but she kept everything, and, uh, you know, Thank goodness for it, because it's really giving us a journey back in time. Sure, sure. Thank you, uh, Mom Cammer, for holding on to these uh, artifacts. You know, this type of thing disappears pretty quickly. Once you grow out of it, what are you going to be able to do with this? And we do have a pretty good collection of jackets and clothing. Uh, but down the line, I don't think we have a Cub Scout uniform. Well, so, I think you're going to. I think you're going to yeah, inherit one one Sure, day. sure. I'll try to fit in it, but <laughs> it won't work. Um, so this is from uh, the Hoboken Shore Railroad, and uh, we think this was actually kind of a decal that would have been put on the side of the cars. Do you think? They actually had purchased some rail cars, some box cars at that time that they painted blue, and this decal was actually, um, you know, there was a sticky 
part to it that they put on the box cars. Right. Uh, and they gave me one because uh, obviously I had spent all my time right. uh, down there. I watched them paint oh, cool. the, the box cars. So, so where was their kind of repair yard or kind of holding place where you would see all these cars together? You know, it's hard to see because it they changed the whole buildings. It's probably on the corner, I guess it would be 15th and Bloomfield. I think you're right. right. And uh, there was at the end, I think it was 1977, there was uh, in Hoboken's flavor, there was a fire that uh, burned the uh, the engine house, but I don't think it was related to anything. I think it was just vandalation. But right. but at that point, the Hoboken Shore Railroad was not serving anybody anymore. So it eventually went bankrupt. Uh, I'm told they didn't really own the real estate. It was kind of like a, a, a subsidiary of the uh, Erie Lackawanna. Okay. So, and uh, also the uh, government, I think, bought some of the land because during the war, they wanted to have some of the railroads serve the- uh, Sure, the that sounds right. You know, during an emergency act that we need this transportation. Which is a shame because they had some valuable real estate that they- Right, right, right. They only knew. Um, so I, th I remember the expression for the Hoboken Shore Railroad was the littlest railroad in America or something along those lines. I, I believe and, that. It, right. You know, it's interesting. It only served, well, Hoboken's only one mile, and it only served uh, Hoboken. But uh, there were at least 15 to 20 freight cars coming in and out of uh, the railroad a day. Sure. So if you multiply that for the week with Maxwell House and everything else, it's a right. pretty impressive and, uh, amount you know, of... Uh, I never experienced it, but a great sight, a railroad car and engine going down Hudson Street, uh, right? Absolutely. And uh, and like you said, double park cars and, you know, what do we do? And back then, double parking was kind of the way to go. They would blow their horn to, to let you know that they were coming. To, and then people would come out of the apartment buildings and move their right. cars. Throw the keys down <laughs> so the guys would move it, that kind of thing. And then, so you just kind of befriended them and they just said, come on, kid, hop aboard yeah. for a ride. I, you know, I don't know why. I mean, they were very nice to me. And I think other people also had the opportunity to go on. Uh, there was also a, um, there's a website, a fan club that has some pictures. There was a Hoboken fan trip that was up in about 1965, 66, that shows a lot of pictures of, uh, of Hoboken at that time. And you have these people standing in these gondolas, which they'd never get away with today. Right. And they actually did, did a tour of the Hoboken Shore Railroad. Uh, right. I, I also, um, John Reese was the president at that time of the Hoboken Shore Railroad, and his son was about the same age as mine. So I actually got a, a sleepover on a passenger train because they had purchased a passenger train. For so, the tour? For, no, for his no. birthday. Oh, For really? the son's birthday. So okay. he had a birthday party and he invited me over and I was I had a sleepover on the passenger train in the rail yard. Wow, okay. So that was... Um, something very very memorable sure. for me. and then we've seen some articles in like new york star ledger and other press that there is a, a rail society in new jersey and that they have actually purchased one of these engines they purchased engine 700 and they're uh they're now in a restoration um project to try to i get i think i got from the midland railroad uh where the hoboken shore railroad engine wound up and they, I guess, contacted this organization, and they're going to refurbish it. Wow. Uh, and we're going to try to get them to come to the uh, Hoboken Museum, I think, if we can. Yeah, we'd love to do a talk with them. And so if you, if you can be our emissary for that, and that would be great. Um, and or and else so, Hoboken Talks. And this is a ruler as well that uh, right. they got. This was a metal ruler, so it gives the location. And it's interesting, I guess we were commenting earlier, serving Hoboken's largest industries and all steamship piers. Right, right. And Ford 19 Bloomfield, like you said. So that's the... So uh, that's going to be above 14th Street in the 15th Street area. Correct. Right at the okay. beginning of, uh, yep. of the... And is that their color, yellow? That was the color, the yellow and green was okay. the color of the engine. Okay. Uh, I have other pictures, but because of, you know, I don't own them. So I didn't want to share them, but uh, I have many, many other pictures of the, of, of the train as well. Okay, okay. Ah, Pied Piper. Ah, yes. So this is a, a picture in the 13th uh, Street alleyway of myself and my uh, sister. She has a very colorful dress, uh, almost like a Indian or 60 style. Uh, 
and I guess um, my father took this picture of us in the alleyway. So when we were growing up, for some reason, I went to uh, A.J. Demarest uh, Junior High School, and my brother and sister went to Brandt. So we had two different band conductors. Uh, I had uh, Mr. Farina was on, and the Demer side, I think it was Mr. Ortega was the band director in the, um, the Brandt okay. side. So uh, this is how we got an introduction. Uh, Mom ah. made the dress. Mom uh, was a hippie. So there you go. No, just kidding. Just kidding, Mom. <laughs> um, so are we looking towards Hudson? or This is going, I guess, uh, south. So the so, alleyway is going up towards 13th Street, which is in the background. Right. And uh, there's other alleyways because that's how, uh, obviously, Hoboken has, you know, you have the two um, houses on either side of the street. Right. And that alleyway I'm, I'm a little confused orientation. We're sitting at 13th and Hudson, so we're so close. We are. Very, this is between Washington and Bloomfield. Okay. On 13th that. Street. Sure. So it's right here. It's, yeah. Uh, yeah. And then we, you know, we commented earlier. So this fact, is the news. It's right that's, here. Yes. So this is the new picture right. of that same alleyway. I'm so glad I, you took this. Yeah, this helps set the the viewpoint. And I think Rand said, I think Rand, you lived in the, in the background here. I think you mentioned <laughs> to me. Uh, right. So yeah, this is, and it obviously it's changed. Applied housing. Right. Um, oh, Mr. Cut uh, Mr. Costello was the brand director. Okay, Melody has all these details. <laughs> Very cool. And we got obviously uh, involved in, in in the band. Uh, right. So it was Melody in the band. Uh, I don't know, Melody. Did you play an instrument? Maybe you could comment. I mean, her first name is Melody, so <laughs> must you know, be right. Must uh, be a connection. And uh, oh, this is how can you get more Hoboken than this? Yeah, this is just the the older band uniforms, so red and uh, red and white. Um, mm -hmm. And again, I'm holding my clarinet. So we had moved from 13th Street to 6th Street. Uh, I guess Applied Housing had renovated the houses on 13th Street. Ah, see, flute. There you go. Yeah, Melody. I knew it. I knew it. Ellen probably should have known that as well. <laughs> well, Melody, too. Um, and, and so we, um, this is in front of a, a, a Sixth and Garden when we moved into the house. Uh, applied housing renovated the 13th Street building. So talk a little bit about that. You lived in one location, which was... 13th and Bloom Bloomfield. Bloomfield, and... And then we moved to Sixth and uh, Garden. Why? Well, uh, at that time, Applied Housing was renovating a lot of the buildings in Hoboken. And thanks to them, they gave us a stipend to move to our house. They covered moving costs and some of the down payment costs. And we were able to purchase a house in Hoboken because of Applied Housing. So you never really went back to that original apartment, but they gave you kind of a little nest egg to correct take the mortgage on the new place. And so it was very helpful. Now, of course, with my hockey days, I had to try to find a way to go back to 13th Street. Right, your old buddies. And I had uh, a dolly set up on my bike where I used to put a hockey net that I used to, uh, I mean, I, I don't know if anybody remembers it at the, at the time. So I used to just go down Bloomfield Street, back to 13th Street. And that's where I used to play with, um, a, his name is uh, Bob Fishbach. And he played with Sammy that I, and he's the one, I don't know why I ever chose goalie because if you think about it, people were shooting pucks at me. I mean, yeah, how could I'm that... looking at your teeth as we speak? I mean, okay. I I could have picked a better position than goalie. I right. don't know, but you had that foreboding mask, so it ah, that's right. people. And so, what's the address on Garden? Uh, Six Twelve Garden Street. Okay, sure. And we lived there many years. And my parents, thankfully, lived a long time, so we, uh, you know, and. I thought I eventually would move back to Hoboken in that house, but my father wanted to sell it. Uh, so it was his decision to sell the house. Otherwise, we would still have been living in 612 Garden Street. Right. We, we won't lament on that. No. Okay. It was his choice. It was his sure. decision. Uh, and? So back to the band. So this is a Hoboken High School um, a band jacket that, thanks to my mom again, I kept. I didn't even know she had kept it until years later she gave it back to me. Uh, I had worn it here today, but I, it takes over the red background, so we we chose not to. Uh, That's right. We toned it down. We a toned it bit. down a little bit, it's... but I I wanted to present it for the show because obviously again Hoboken, and that's sure. our theme for tonight. And I will testify that it still fits you. It still fits me. Uh, <laughs> the Cub Scout uniform. No, you were too young. But, <laughs> yeah, this this is high school. 
Ah, and I have mine too from and, Ellen. And you know okay. why? Thanks to my mother. As yeah, well. <laughs> definitely. Do you still have that dress, uh, <laughs> Ellen, with the that she'll have Indian to comment motif? on. Indian motif. No. Okay. Um, okay. And speaking different of, uniforms. So my brother said that they purchased these uniforms. They didn't have to. So I, I don't know the whole history behind it. He does. Uh, Michael is a source of Hoboken knowledge that I cannot even replace. He's unbelievable. Where's Michael tonight? Michael, uh, he might be on the train because he, he leaves Trenton. He works in Trenton. Oh. So he probably has, I don't know if he'll check in late, but he, uh, right. he should he'll be watch catching. It, uh, he later, could watch I'm it. Sure. Ever. But maybe down the line, we'll get the other brother. Ah, if he's willing yeah. to do it. Yes. Sure. Ah. <laughs> See, she said, unless I um, have it, okay. the dress. Yeah, then uh, we don't okay. know where it is. And Ellen is um, right next to the bass drum. She didn't believe she didn't have glasses at that time, but we did prove it to her. Uh, uh, we she, did Photoshop. We, uh, no. <laughs> Actually, she didn't mention that, but uh, and, and this picture looks like it's either sixth or uh, it's probably ninth. And Hard written. to tell. Hard to tell. It's actually a TH, but we don't know the actual streets. Right. And this sure. is uh, after I graduated, so this is probably 1977. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Okay. Now back to the street hockey theme. So uh, we had called ourselves uh, Hoboken Nighthawks. Uh, I was never sure of the spelling of Nighthawks. I thought it should have been N-I-G-H-T Hawks, but they had chosen the K. And a group of us went to Stan Sporting uh, Center. And, you know, they helped us on a lot of different jackets, not only for the high school, but our street hockey team. And uh, I mean, know, that's pretty cool that you were uh, as much a, a unit that you went and got jackets. You know, it's interesting at that time with Hoboken, um, you know, obviously everybody moved on after the graduating from, from high school, but it was really a close knit uh, town with, with just the different neighborhoods and the different people. Now, obviously with the, uh, the Hoboken uh, street hockey team, I knew people from, all over the city right because uh you know everybody had different talents not everybody was a good skater or, or they could hit the puck well so i got to meet a lot of people from all over hoboken right so you're on like rollerblade skates or, or were they this was them, this or? was roller roller street hockey absolutely we did not play the foot uh, there was sometimes where we may have but it was mostly on roller skates right and i had these big single bladed uh, skates that i used as a goalie that I had to put wood on the side because I would scrape up the metal. Yeah. And uh, it, it was, it's much easier playing street hockey than ice hockey. Ice hockey is right. much more challenging. But still, there probably were a few bloody noses. Oh, yes. I got scraped up shims. I did shims. get scraped up a couple of times. Absolutely. Right. Yes. And would you have a, I don't know hockey that well. How many people generally on the hockey team? Well, there's five plus the goalie. So there's six total. Uh, I don't know if we, honored the amount of people for street hockey because we didn't have, we didn't have much room right uh a lot of times it would be just pickup games with a couple of people but this was a whole team uh i don't know who the other teammates we may have played with the so uh, you did play hockey. against other teams we played against, but i think they were all hoboken kids. Uh, based yeah. kids sure sure it's pretty cool my grandma i love this stuff my grandmother always called hoboken children's village and the, what does that mean to uh, you, Eric, when this, she says that? This is very, very true. So, you know, one of the difference, that not only Hoboken, but elsewhere, when you move into a house, like when we moved from 13th Street to 6th Street, you're more restricted because you don't see your neighbors as much. Uh, you might have block parties or things to try to get the neighborhood together. But when you live in, in an apartment building, I mean, we had three uh, or four different apartment buildings, five stories each. They probably had about three kids each in the buildings. So in a matter of one block, you could have like 200 kids. <laughs> so you, it was kids, wall-to-wall -wall kids. So I think that that comment is very, very uh, right. timely in terms of and, the discussion. And you, know, you would adapt to your games to the space that was available. Absolutely. And uh, <laughs> so that's what I take. Like, you just make it work if it's 13th and... Uh, um, ah, see. Bloomfield. So eleventh, eleventh. Go ahead. You read it. Oh, that's right. And he reminded me that we played at Wallace School. That's right. That was another uh, place. So the old Wallace building was torn down. They built the new Wallace. Um, sure. 
and we played in the Wallace courtyard. I probably played with uh, Sal's brother at that. Uh, right, at there's that kind of a um, playground there now to the south of the school, but maybe you, there was sort of just open space, and that would have been like a big space to play hockey. I mean, the old the old building. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> And every that is, mom was allowed to beat you if you were bad. <laughs> so what does that mean to her? Well, we had to be on our best, uh, you know, um, behavior because, you know, you might see some of the commercials where the uh, mothers are yelling out the window at the kids. So you knew your mother's voice. And if you were misbehaving, you got, you, you got a licking when you got up to the apartment. Right. But Melody's kind of inferring like another mother could intervene if a, if a kid was picking on another kid and sort of uh, squell that one kid, like she almost had permission from the mother I think to kind the, of make peace. For the most part, I mean, Hoboken was a tough town growing up in the in the 70s, so you had to go into survival mode too many times. Right. right? But, uh, you know, for the most part, you had to learn how to get together. I mean, I mean, there were some bullies, obviously, at right. that time. Uh, for the most part, I think the parents would supervise each other right and so i'm just going to ask how tough is tough uh well i didn't get into fights i was a good negotiator so i always got myself out of uh, trouble but uh, there were there were there were some fights uh i ne never saw them personally but you would hear stories about it afterwards right but you know like when you were forming the hockey team or the uh, wiffle ball games you were told which position you had to play. You didn't. You didn't make that selection. Right. So whoever was the bully or the star, sure, of that, sure. That's the one. And would you play wiffle ball in the same location as hockey? Wiffle ball was on the corner of Thirteenth and Bloomfield, so the four corners were the bases. Yeah. And you know, you just tried to hit the ball as far as possible, trying to avoid the cars. Sure. Obviously, bottle caps was also on the same corner, so each. You know, for the bottle caps, you would try to pick the corner. The car was not turning. Right. Because, you know, Hoboken has a lot of one-way streets sure. or back and forth. So you would pick that corner because otherwise, you know, it became very difficult with the cars. Right. And cars were kind of a drag for your game, right? A absolutely. And and with the stickball, interesting with the train, later on when I stopped riding the train, that those double park cars blocked our game on Hudson Street because the train couldn't go by. And it a lot of times ended our game at that time. So wow. that's a different perspective later on in, yeah, my, sure. in my life. And then did you mention that you played stickball uh, closer to where we're sitting now, 13th and Hudson? Absolutely. The, the Well, now it's an entrance. I guess they cut open the building. But the wall used to be the home run wall for stickball. And across the street, there was a small uh, tea factory. And home plate was actually painted onto the wall. Oh, cool, cool. So, and was there anything on the, I'll uh, say, the Bethlehem steel wall? Mm -hmm. No, it because that has that was you would just try to hit the Spalding balls over the, over the roof if you okay, could, right. but you could catch the balls as they were coming off the roof. So and you'd be out, and you'd be out. And okay. I think some shipmen may have gotten hit in the head with the balls <laughs> if if right. you hit it. Uh, they were wearing hard hats though, out. so probably wouldn't have hurt. So cool. Okay, we're moving on. Ah. All right, so not only did my mother, um, you know, collect memorabilia, but my father and I used to go around Hoboken taking pictures. And this is the Stevens Castle. I think, uh, Bob, you mentioned that it did change a little bit because of the new dormitories right. that went up. But uh, this is just a classic picture from the 70s, of, or maybe early 80s, late 70s. Uh, okay, yeah, we're at the Stevens Gate hat. <laughs> The Stevens Gatehouse, kind of the entrance of the campus. Uh, absolutely. And now they use the, I'll say, the turret shaped tower there for security. But the gatehouse is presently down uh, because they were moving big equipment on ah, the I campus. See. The story is that it will come back. It's kind of almost the logo for the school. So I think it will return. Oh, very good. And, and I went to NJIT instead of Stevens. Just the degree was a, a better fit for me at that sure, time. Sure, sure, sure. Um, oh, then... yes. So obviously the guys did not get the opportunity that a lot of times to play hopscotch or double dutch. We did sneak in a few games. And uh, as you mentioned, Johnny on the Pony. Johnny on the Pony is a very politically incorrect game 
uh, for this era. It would never, it would never be pulled off. The uh, boys and girls would jump on each other's back. You form like this long chain. Uh, the worst position was the pillow, because that was against the wall. So the first person on the chain would rest their head against you as people were jumping on each other's backs. And I guess when the chain fell apart, that's when the game ended. Uh, Got it. But it was, it was uh, so remember, we had a lot of kids. We had a lot of different type of games. Uh, and basically, back to that block party uh, story, we had a block party every day. Because sure. you had so many people and so many kids around. It was just, uh, you know, all the women was, uh, would sit outside watching us. And we, we, just had, we just had a lot of fun. All right, but you weren't blocking off the street. It was more of the sidewalk and the gate areas. There, were, there was a front courtyard to, uh, to this building that you could play in and we would play we would play in the front courtyard so there's a front and back courtyard to this so i never really thought about it the closest park to you would be elysian park yes and um and i guess columbus park you know columbus not park that far yes we would uh i guess we'd mostly go to elysian but columbus we would also spend some time in as well uh, but if you you played a really organized game with uh, which really took over space. You kind of knew you were. You had uh, to. You had to go to the park with baby carriages Absolutely. and other things. And would you get chewed out by the park attendant? Or? You, you know, eventually, if we stayed low, mm -hmm. we could play. But you're right. If we interfered with the balls hitting somebody or something like that, right. We we would so ask. like if you're playing football in the park eventually or frisbee eventually you're going to nail a few uh, park exactly uh, folks but football you mentioned uh, the A and P which is I think I don't know if it's Trader Joe's now on on the corner of um, right here Thirteenth and oh, uh, Willow Wolverine. Wolverine. we played football in that parking lot oh really okay sure so any parking lot was a possibility too, became right? became because we didn't have any space. Yeah, the street was too dangerous to play. Right, in. that's what I'm thinking. And of course, you can get hit by a train too. <laughs> absolutely. Uh, oh, it's a melody again. Uh, she's absolutely correct. Uh, oh, Benny Todinos. Yep. Uh, so melody is in Oklahoma, and the band jacket. Melody brings up a very good point. We're trying to order band jackets for people who may not have had them, like I did, and we had an interesting group on Facebook. So we're we're gonna go back to stands. I'll be here next week going to stands, trying to see if we could come up with an order for people who want the old band jacket. Oh, cool, cool. And uh, maybe you can have uh, you know Benny Tadino's uh, ship to them, uh, have it frozen and uh, send it all over the country. Yeah, Melody, I don't know if they uh, they ship around the country, but uh, absolutely, maybe they got to Right, uh, we would have to help with that. <laughs> anyway, you know, I've been meaning to go to stands, so if you come a certain day, let me know. I'd love to go I'll let you know next week because yeah. uh, we're trying to have a, a connection with this uh, band uniform. Uh, I like that. So this, are you uh, letting us know that you did trips out of Hoboken and went to the... to? Uh, Alaska. Alaska. <laughs> so if it's going to be interesting if anybody from Hoboken knows where this picture is before I give it away. But it does look like a picture outside of Hoboken for sure. Right. Um, and this is actually on at that time it was River Road, which is now Sinatra Drive. And my father and I saw this ice formation on these green rocks, which I think we found out was serpentine. Uh, rocks. My my dentist actually graduated from uh, Stevens, and she's a molecular biologist. And she said it's natural asbestos, the green color. Right. And I think serpentine rock. I think is well. What it's it's a schist. I mean, it's described as serpentine. Also, it does have like a scientific name, and uh, it's kind of unusual. And I believe Staten Island also has croppings like this. And there is not, it's not like pure asbestos, but there's natural asbestos in it. And uh, for it to be really dangerous, I believe that it would have to be refined and concentrated. So I don't think it's, you know, dangerous. I thought you were waiting for the Hoboken Shore Railroad. <laughs> and it used to pass right along here. Right. Uh, right. Before they took up the track, I don't know uh, when they took up the tracks. I think it was 
they left them until I they're think, pretty late. They were they I stayed remember. for a long time. Yeah, yeah. And everyone thought most people didn't even know there was a hobo Hoboken Shore Railroad, so they assumed they were trolley tracks. And I think if you showed this picture to anybody, they would never think this was in Hoboken. If, yeah, I mean, we we still get this once in a while uh, now, but it, it's it's unusual. Uh, so Melody's going to call uh, Kenny Tadino. So we'll see what happens. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I think it'd be fun. Um, just like they say, Frank Sinatra used to order bread from Dom's to be shipped out. Oh, really? In Los oh, Angeles. Yeah, I, I didn't know that story. Uh, so where are we? All right, so this is on on the waterfront, uh, late late seventies or early eighties, and we saw this picture of this Hoboken princess, which we're still trying to identify what that really is, but it really does look like somebody's living here because there's a clothesline. Uh, um, yeah. uh, so I don't know uh, what the actual story is behind this, but you, you could see in New York in the background, so the buildings. Not yeah, that New York in has the small is buildings. The Empire State Building. But now and you can hardly see the Empire State Building because the buildings are just yeah, they're surrounding encroaching. it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I don't I couldn't tell you exactly where we are. Um, we're probably, it's probably fifth, around maybe? fifth or sixth. There was a lot of, shall we say, abandoned uh, boats down there, uh, down where the old Holland America but it uh, looks like a house, even. Well, it's I think it's a deck house that was on uh, a boat or a barge makes and sense. it's sunken down. So it does look, you know, it looks like they even have uh, flower boxes. So I, I wonder, there was a period where people lived on barges and, but I can't, I, the laundry is kind of confusing. <laughs> I was almost wondering if they had adopted this site to shoot a film or something, because it does seem a little surreal. And Hoboken Princess, is it a joke? I know. I, I don't know if anyone knows about this time period uh, and recognizes it, but it's sure evocative. I mean, do we have balloons hanging from the clothesline? It looks yeah. like I that mean, as It's well. almost like a fantasy scene, like a dream. So, and there have been different film shoots that have done that, but I'm not familiar with Hoboken Princess. Uh, I've never seen it before. So just a just a classic. I mean, yeah, no, cool. I'd live there. And because it says Hoboken, that's why we had it in yes. our theme for tonight. Yes, as and well. this is not taken right after Sandy. No, uh, no. This is uh, probably seventies. You think? Uh, this is. I think. I believe this is a seventies. Yeah. So maybe someone watching this later will go, "Hey, yeah, I grew up on that thing." Anyway, it's a great shot. And. Uh, and We're of course, around here, we can't have a, uh, of course, the train theme. I like trains, as everybody knows on this uh, that know me. But this is a uh, picture of the Erie Lackawanna, uh, late 70s, because New Jersey Transit took over the line in 1980, 81. But this is a classic picture of the Edison electric trains coming into the Hoboken Terminal. So we like to take night pictures because they were more challenging with the film. Um, and we were able to get a good a good picture of the of the train at night. Right, you're you know the this is a covered sheds, uh, you know that the uh, train is sort of waiting for its passengers, or they keep those things running all the time, right? So who knows? But in the day, that train station was considered innovative just because it had so many modes of transportation, transportation Absolutely. hub. And then also there's space in the middle of these sheds so that when it, when it was coal fired, the steam and the smoke would rise through and not just sort of flood everyone with all the uh, vapors and, uh, in a sense, pollution from the engines. And I took this train going to NJIT from Hoboken. Cool. And, uh, they had a... A smoking car back then. Yeah. So if you went a club car, a smoking car, if you went through that car, you could not see a thing. There was so right, much. There was right. so much smoke. And a bar car. Right? And a bar car. Yeah, yes. sure. And so I'm surprised you didn't get a job with the trains. You know, I had considered it to be an engineer on the train line. Uh, I, I don't know. My path went to computers instead. Yeah. Uh, so I I stuck with the pharmaceutical industry and computer programming and 
I spent all my life doing that. Uh, right. That the Kaya wise decision. For I think path, the, but... it's a very dangerous job, by yeah. the way, being an engineer on a train. So sure. I think in general, I think it was a good career move. Right. Right. Okay. Nice shot. And this is another classic Hoboken picture. Uh, this obviously is Court Street. Uh, again, we tried to get a night picture in terms of just the effects, but this is also in the 70s, and it's just just a beautiful picture of the cobblestones at night, uh, where and on the waterfront was also filmed. Uh, yeah, I don't know if this was the exact location. Uh, I think it was more closer to the church on Fourth. I believe um, there are a few scenes, but the one where the broken they, window one. Uh, yeah, that's a. You know, I could be wrong, but I've always been told that was, again, Court Street, but much further south, uh, closer to behind the Hoboken Trust Bank and behind, uh, like, the old Fabian Theater. Ah, I you know, see. that I see. area. And uh, so, but I could be wrong. You know, that's my sense of it. Ah, yes. Okay. My, my brother-in-law as well. Yes, he knows I, I like trains. Sure. And actually, you took the train to get here tonight, right? That's right. So uh, actually, most people would rather drive rather than being, um, you know, on a train. But for me, it's my first choice rather than my last choice, but only because I think more of my love on trains because uh, but coming to Hoboken with the parking, I think it's a better choice. And I was able to walk from the train terminal down to uh, here on uh, 13th and uh, and Hudson. So it was a good walk. It was kind of kind of cold but it was a nice brisk walk and i think that's an advantage that hoboken has you can really walk to most points sure. in hoboken and you got here early and i got here early so the train was on time and uh yeah it was it was uh, a, a a very good trip right and i'll be taking it back sure i'll drive you down ah, okay. um so okay and we have okay, ephemera so, here so this is um i guess the industrial uh education of Hoboken. This was in the library building on, uh, I guess it's Fifth and Park Avenue where the library is. So my mother took a sewing class and they had offered programs. They had bookkeeping. They had other programs. This is uh, like, the, I guess you would call the closing ceremonies of that of that time. But she, she was a seamstress and she took, um, you know, uh, she would parade her uh, outfits during the show. Hmm. Uh, my brother, myself, and Ellen, we were not as interested, so we were roaming the uh, the library trying to pass time. But uh, my mother even got into the act. I I didn't include my sister, but my sister also was a candy striper in St. Mary's Hospital. And there were some programs and shows also that they had done as fundraisers there. So we all got into the act. My brother also played the flute as well. I think he may have also been in the, uh, in the chorus. So... You know, Hoboken, this is an example where Hoboken gave an opportunity for you to do other things rather than just play stickball sure. and hockey and other things. Uh, um, yes. Yeah. And, and I guess she may have sewn that. Uh, that's that's what it class, appears. Right? And, you know, before I forget, I, um, I have to give a shout out to my uh, wife, Pam, because this is on December 23rd in 1985 was the anniversary when we met. Um, so I couldn't go without doing that. So that's tonight. That is tonight. And a very interesting Hoboken story on how we met. She gave me permission to say this. And my cousin Mitchell, who's listening, I said I had a surprise for him. So he is a rock and roller. And he used to have concerts in the Limelight, which is on um, Times Square building, I think it is, one Times Square, where the, where the ball drops. And he used to invite us over to these concerts. Well, my wife on the, well, my future wife, i going back, passed out on the path train going home. And my sister, who became a nurse at that time, suggested that she go, she would go to the St. Mary's Hospital. So my parents met Pam in St. Mary's Hospital for the first time. Got you. So I thought that was so, just a, uh, another whole book. So it's all, see, that's why I said yeah, it's all Hoboken's interconnected. Yeah, the center of the world for the camera family. So Hoboken actually was instrumental for me meeting my future wife. So right. Gotcha. Gotcha. And so you're talking about the limelight in New York. The limelight right? in New York. Which the, was in an old church. It was, uh, I think it was called, it It was a club. Um, ah, it's it's kind of in the village. 
it right was pan. maybe I'm wrong with it was, but it was in the Times Square building. Maybe maybe it was further down in the building. Oh, maybe it was the church. You're right. Yeah, yeah. So that was always a little controversial that place because it was like a club, but it was but also it was a, in church. a church. And you know, when you walked in, there was the baptismal uh, setup oh. and you know the holy water. But it was sort of the funny thing is somewhat not desecrated, but you know, it was kind of like a little. My aunt and uncle went, my mother and father came. So here you have these, uh, shows you how loyal they are to my cousin Mitchell. They were to go, even though it wasn't their uh, yes. cup, of, cup of tea. Right, right. But to show, you know. Uh, That's why I got confused because it, you know, was sort of a young person's thing. And they went. They, and the, as I remember, its nickname was the Slime Light. Oh, the Slime Light. Because, <laughs> you know. The next day, you would see the 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 swill being uh, cleaned Oh, out. okay, yeah. okay. Anyway, sorry, we diverted a little. So we, I just wanted to mention that. Sure. Uh, ah, there's my my uh, Shout cousin out to the limelight. So he was okay. he, he's the rock and roller. Who's on HQ? Your HQ is his uh, uh, his company. Okay, got it. But got it's it. Mitchell. His name is Mitchell. Sure, sure. And uh, we're getting kind of towards the end. I think we got a few more visuals, but we've been going for a solid hour. So this is good. What do we got here? So again, I like trains. So this was at the 2000 Renaissance Festival uh, in the Hoboken Terminal. I guess the New Jersey Transit, as well as the PATH, used to have a festival that they used to have everybody together. Right. I think the oh. city also may have participated they, they there did well. but it was really you know new jersey it was transit. new jersey transit it was fun so obviously a path bag since i'm a train fanatic they my mother probably picked this up for me i don't remember if i was at this specific um show but um i can't believe that she kept this and i kept this yeah. for so many years. usually they have mugs and things like that that would kind of be your tchotchka so, so here's, I think you'll get the answer, but I'm just throwing it out there. Uh, just can you share with people what PATH stands for? Port Authority Trans Hudson. Yes. Okay, <laughs> good. A lot of people don't know that. And if I want to stump, you know, visitors to the museum, I threw it out. But now, I course, knew you'd know. I would be embarrassed if I didn't know the answer to that. Okay. With my, with I, my background. I was just going, I hope Eric gets this. I don't want to embarrass him. <laughs> Whatever. So cool. And Hoboken too. Uh, what was the Hudson Tubes before that? Yes. Uh, also known as the Hudson Manhattan Railroad. That's right. That's right. right. Yes. So okay. Uh, and I think this might be our last uh, really slide. Okay. Can we start over again? <laughs> no. Just getting ran. Okay. So this is a classic Hoboken picture. So uh, I come into Hoboken, as everybody knows, at least once a week for a variety of reasons. Um, my brother also lives here, even though. The pandemic slowed us down a little bit, but I'm I wanted to find a place to park, and I'm looking at this tree, trying to understand this poor tree. <laughs> how if I could park at this time, and I got out and I read, and I think it was more morning for this particular time, but I think this is just a classic Hoboken picture. It's not a negative. I think it's a positive because it's parking. Parking is a challenge uh, in Hoboken, as we know. Uh, one reason I did take the train uh, tonight, but I think this is a classic Hoboken picture in terms of just trying to figure out whether you could park if you're a non-resident. Remember, for you right. and others, it's a little easier because you have the dark green and the light green. Right, that's green. the odd and even side, but this would pertain to everyone. This was probably on Newark uh, right. and I think maybe um, Grant, Newark and Grant or okay. Newark and Sure, it could be anywhere, Park. though. And now they're a little nicer, like they will, if you're, okay. So ah. do you want to read Pam's comment there? So there was one time where I dropped off uh, Pam and my daughter, Naomi, and I could not find a place to park. <laughs> so they got, to, they got to enjoy my parents. I basically dropped them off and picked them up because I could not find parking on this right. particular day. Uh, and on New Year's Eve, one time I, I got, into a discussion, I'll call it, of our parking space. But so you met one of the old bullies. I met one of the old bullies. He wanted the spot, and so did I, and I eventually won out. Um, but uh, there was, so I, I went up to say hello to my parents and goodbye, and they, they. Right. Uh, this is a perfect segue to let people know that when they visit the Hoboken ah. Historical Museum, we actually have free parking. 
and uh, you go into the Little Man Parking Garage at 12th and Chipyard Lane. The entrance is on Chipyard Lane, and they will allow you to park for three hours, and we validate here in the museum. Doesn't get any better. So your $5 admission gets you the parking and entrance to the museum. So thank you for letting me. Uh, You're you know, welcome. And on I that. took advantage of that a couple of weeks ago. Right. And uh, sure. it was very easy to do. So uh, really, the I would well, I, any as you see, I'm a, a passionate Hoboken fan as well as the museum. But the museum is just great for any of the history of Hoboken. And we can solve your parking problem for Absolutely. three hours. <laughs> and it, it could take three hours to visit the museum because we're so big but you could use it to have lunch at La Isla across the street. Too. Very, very good. Yeah, um, free parking is appreciated. Yes, yeah. Parking and Hoboken are kind of have this weird synergy that is usually negative, but we can solve it for you if you visit the museum. You know, for me, because of the parking, I love getting into tight spots, but I, I don't think everybody enjoys it as right, much. Right, right. <laughs> I'm having a little trouble with my power steering, but normally if there's a spot big enough for a Subaru legacy, I can get in with a quarter of an inch tolerance. But anyway, so we've had a great hour here uh, with Eric, and uh, we've connected before this, but I feel we've super connected. Absolutely. And, uh, and I want to thank I want to thank you as as well because you're giving me it's almost like coming home mm -hmm. because I grew up here in front of the museum I'm uh, I played stickball right in front right so for me obviously I have a better uh, appreciation of the place than most but sure. I, I think anybody from Hoboken should really appreciate that gotcha. thanks for all the plugs and uh, we're gonna kind of wrap it up now uh, the show is Hoboken talks and please spread the word uh, up. Coming talks, uh, Jack Silver will be interviewing Tammy Faye Starlight. And Jack says, and Danny Schott says that Tammy Faye Starlight is the most interesting person in Hoboken. But I'm going to say that another upcoming talk is with Lenny Lutze, historian of Hoboken, and he could be the most interesting. So there's a little uh, face off on that, and you too can decide. Who's more interesting, Tammy or Lenny? <laughs> and, uh, you know, Hoboken Talks uh, has various supporters, and we always give a shout out in memory of Donald Shackett, who did his estate planning, and he has passed, uh, and they gave a major gift to the museum, which is much, much, much appreciated. And then other supporters are the New Jersey Historical Commission, the best state agency in New Jersey. And they are a big supporter for general operating support, our grants, and even this program with some of the equipment we have. And applied companies, uh, we thank them every day as a donor of the space that we're sitting in uh, with our 100 year lease at a reasonable rate and makes so many things possible. And uh, I also want to give a big shout out to Rand Hoppe. He's our engineer uh, and sort of the man behind the curtain and uh, makes this program possible with, again, him coming up with the idea and being the engineer for over 40 episodes. And uh, if you do visit the museum, we, we do have a very popular exhibit now called The Avenue. A History of Washington Street, there couldn't be a better topic for an exhibit because everyone knows Washington Street. Whether you're four years old or 94 years old, you have a story about Washington Street. And uh, right now in our upper gallery where we're broadcasting from, you still have a chance to see, uh, I'll say the amazing paintings by Frank Hannivan, a plein air painter, who does live in Jersey City, but does spend a lot of time in Hoboken painting streetscapes by standing on the corner as a plein air artist. And, I, you know, very popular. And uh, you still can see that till January 2nd. And uh, Melody Joyce says, love hearing the Hoboken accents. 
who has a Hoboken accent? Okay, I'm walking here. And Ellen is in there for good job, Eric. This, I'm going to say, is probably one of Eric's bucket list items to appear on Hoboken Talks. And I'm going to guess his next bucket list is to appear again <laughs> on Hoboken Talks. Also giving a plug to the next Upper Gallery exhibit. It's uh, paintings, uh, art by Karen Gersh. Uh, Karen's theme in a lot of her paintings is circus arts. And she actually was a student at the Circus Arts School on Washington Street and was inspired by attending that school to perform in circuses and also make her art about the circuses. So we are kind of have all these intersections of things. So uh, have a great holiday here uh, and spread the word about Hoboken Talks and see you in the museum and see you on the avenue. Thanks, everyone.